The purpose of this video program is to teach the mechanics of and the conditioning necessary to deal with emergency situations in an automobile. The training information in this video program is in no way a substitute for the hands-on experience of a licensed driver training course. This program does not endorse unsafe driving of any kind. Do not try anything shown in this course without the supervision of a licensed professional instructor. When you drive to work in the morning, you drive through a maze of narrow corridors and constantly shifting passages that require concentration, quick reflexes, and hundreds of split-second unconscious decisions. Multiply all those chances at a life-threatening mistake each day by all the days in your life that you drive, and you realize that your conditioned responses, the blending of your habits, techniques, and judgment have to be foolproof for you to survive. I'm Sam Posey. I've been around cars and racing almost all my life, driving in Indianapolis and Le Mans, more recently doing race commentary for ABC Sports. Today we're going to learn how to work within the limits of a car's performance capabilities to avoid collisions that, even at everyday speeds, might seem unavoidable. Now, watching this tape won't necessarily make you a skilled driver, but it will give you an understanding of the principles, the skills, and the techniques that allow a racing driver to handle life-threatening emergencies as if they were routine. Sandy Stevens has taught thousands of police and other people who drive emergency vehicles how to get the most out of their cars in emergency situations. And this program is based on the techniques used in his course. Well, that's right, Sam. One of the things we've found over the years that we've been teaching this course is that people really need to know that there's a very thin line between complete control and no control. And once you've lost control, it's very difficult to get it back. Now, the techniques that we'll be looking at are the same that race car drivers use. We'll be talking about limits, your cars, yours, and how they work together. Most people think of seatbelts as a means of protection from serious injury in a crash. What many don't realize is that a seatbelt can help avoid an accident. The seatbelt holds the driver in position to operate the vehicle, even under the pressure of an emergency maneuver or sudden stop. We're able to stay in our seat because we're literally strapped into it. And how we sit, it's going to be more than a matter of just comfort. Think of the seat as a platform from which the driver can be the most efficient with the controls. Start out by adjusting the seat precisely each time you get in the car. You want to sit so that with your arms straight and your wrists draped across the top of the wheel, your shoulders are in full contact with the seat back. If you drop your hands down to three and nine o'clock or close to it on the steering wheel, you'll have just the right bend in the elbows. Driving with your hands this way, you can make half a turn of the wheel without sliding your hands or changing their position and you won't pull your shoulders off the seat back. Now, my wrists are just straight enough so that I can see the backs of my hands. In addition to finding the best hand position, you'll need to find the proper foot position. Your left foot should be on the floor to the left of the clutch or brake. From this position, I can push my hips back into the seat with my left leg and brace my lower body. Your right heel should be resting at the base of the gas pedal. If you're positioned properly, both of your feet will be on the same plane. We all have a comfort level when we drive. 
Most of us drive so our passengers feel safe and secure, and we send signals with our driving that tell other drivers that they can trust us to drive in a safe and reasonable way. Braking or steering hard enough to squeal the tires sends the wrong message to other drivers, so we quite correctly think of this behavior as inappropriate unless circumstances give us no choice. Studies have shown that this comfort level allows us to use about three quarters of the car's ability to brake in turn before we start to feel uneasy. In fact, 99% of our driving is below that level. Drivers who have learned to use all the car has to offer have half as many crashes, and each crash costs on average one-fifth as much as those of untrained drivers. The Stevens Advanced Driver Training Car Control course gives drivers the chance to gain this experience in the safety of a closed course environment. Like the course, this program will show you what you need to know in that split second when the choice between a crash and a near miss is in your hands. Steering the car at low speeds is simple and straightforward. In an emergency, though, it's a different story. The problem is that we pick up bad habits in everyday driving that don't seem important until something goes wrong. Let's look at steering in a way that prepares us for handling that emergency somewhere down the road. We don't usually think of two or three miles an hour as significant. We tend to round everything off to the nearest five. I mean, after all, that's how the lines on the speedometer are placed. But within a range of three miles per hour, we've gone from effortless control to the very edge of control and back. On this first run through the slalom course, I'm holding the speed to exactly 40 miles an hour. Notice how the turns are very smooth, the tires aren't sliding at all, and the car is always ready for the next turn. The car felt like it could make it through the cones at as much as 45 or 50 miles an hour, but we held it to an extra two. Notice how the tires are starting to slide in the turns and the car is starting to fishtail. At 42 miles an hour, Sandy is using more steering wheel. The turns look ragged and not exactly alike. The smooth transitions from one turn to the next are gone, and the sound of the tires suggests that we've reached the car's limit. Now let's add one more mile an hour. Even an experienced driver starts to hit cones and go off course. Notice how much steering Sandy has to do, how fast he has to turn the wheel just to keep up. At 40 miles an hour, when the tires aren't sliding at all, we need the same amount of steering as we would in normal driving. At 42 miles an hour, the sliding front tires mean we have to turn the wheel more to get the car to turn the same amount. At 43 miles an hour, almost twice as much steering is needed to make the same turn. Another key element of the slalom course is timing. Well, that's true, Sam. If you turn the steering wheel too late, then you have to turn it too much and too fast. This car has waited too long to start the first turn and was never able to catch up. Each turn is bigger than the last, resulting in a complete loss of control. This car, going exactly the same speed, has more room for each turn and can turn the wheel more slowly because it started the first turn sooner. The steering wheel should turn to its point of furthest rotation for only an instant and then start right back the other way. The smooth, constant motion of the steering wheel produces a smooth, predictable response. We can see that just a few more miles an hour can make the car much harder to control and that smooth steering is as important to control as it is to comfort. Out on the interstate, the same skills learned in the slalom can give you the control you need if the driver just ahead slams on his brakes and you have to swerve to avoid a crash. an underinflated tire will start to slide at a much lower speed because even at normal cornering speeds, the weight of the car rolls the sidewall into contact with the road. But radial tires may not look underinflated when they are not cornering. Since you can't tell by looking, your best bet is to carry a tire pressure gauge in the car and to use it often. Keep the hands at 3 and 9 o'clock. 
Keep the shoulders against the seat back by pushing gently against the wheel with the palms. The elbows should be slightly bent. Turn the wheel quickly and smoothly. Remember that even a small increase in speed can affect control. Two or three miles an hour can mean the difference between complete control and no control. Tire pressure affects the car's handling more than anything else, and it's something that you can control. Up to this point, we've been relying just on the steering to get through the slalom. But it's not just your hands on the wheel that are doing the work. To drive safely and effectively, you have to brake properly as well. At 60 miles an hour, a car is traveling almost 90 feet per second. Yet stopping safely can sometimes be reduced to a matter of inches. If the front brakes lock, the driver is unable to steer. No matter how much the steering wheel is turned, the car will go straight. Should you lock up your front brakes, but need to have the ability to steer around a situation, let off the brake a little in order to let the front tires roll on the pavement. Locking up all four wheels is something that you will likely do only in an extreme emergency. When you do lock up all four wheels, your car will always skid in the same direction you were going when you locked up the brakes. If you have lost control of your car and are in a slide, it is probably better to lock up all four wheels. The direction your car will travel is more predictable. More importantly, if you don't lock up your wheels, your car will slide much further down the roadway and the direction your car travels in will be less predictable. Remember, Time wasted at the start of a panic stop adds up to many more feet of stopping distance. And keep in mind that even cars with power brakes require considerable force to lock up all four wheels. At 50 miles an hour, you're traveling about 75 feet a second. It takes the average driver half to three quarters of a second to react, according to the National Safety Council. Once you see the brake lights of the car in front, you'll travel three car lengths before you can put on your own brakes. That means your brakes go on right where his did. It also means that you'll stop in the same place. Trouble is, he's already there. If you're less than three car lengths behind, it's impossible to stop in time. To be safe, you need double that. With all the weight sticking the front tires to the road, it doesn't take much of a turn on the steering wheel to produce a slide at the back. Here, we are stopping the car as fast as we can from 50 miles an hour. Notice how the rear wheels almost come off the ground. With so little weight on the rear tires, it's easy to start a rear wheel skid. Smooth and steady steering will keep the car stable. Pumping the brakes is one way the driver can maintain steering control under heavy braking. Every time the brake is released, the tires roll enough to steer the car. The driver has to hit the brakes hard enough to lock the brakes on every pump and fast enough to keep the nose of the car from bouncing back up between pumps. Just keep in mind that this is a more violent procedure and it is very hard on the tires. It takes half to three quarters of a second just to react. A good rule of thumb is to leave a two to three second gap between your car and the car in front of you at any speed. If the front brakes lock, the driver can't steer. Locking all four brakes will stop the car in a straight line, even if the car itself is rotating. To avoid a rear wheel skid, the driver's hands need to be calm and steady. 
Pumping the brakes is a dependable and easily mastered emergency braking technique. All manufacturers now provide, as either standard equipment or as an option, an alternative method of controlling braking force called an anti-lock braking system, or ABS. ABS is designed to prevent the wheels from locking up under braking, no matter what the type or condition of the road surface under the tires. ABS makes it possible for the driver to steer aggressively, even in that rare emergency when the driver is forced to use maximum brake pedal pressure. Let's look at how ABS works. Sensors at each wheel monitor how fast the wheels are turning and send this information to an onboard computer. If the computer senses that one of the wheels is about to lock up, the computer activates the anti-locking system, which, in effect, pumps the brakes many times per second. This prevents the wheel from locking up and keeps it just on the edge of locking up where braking force is greatest. This pumping action often causes a harsh vibration that can be heard and felt through the pedal. Many drivers who were unfamiliar with ABS have mistaken this vibration for a problem with the car. Don't panic. This is normal. It means that the system is working. ABS doesn't add braking force to your car. It only controls the application of that force in a different way. With standard brakes, heavy braking can cause the wheel to stop turning. With ABS, no matter how hard the driver steps on the brakes, the wheel keeps turning. All ABS-equipped cars have an indicator light on the dash that comes on for a moment when the ignition key is turned on. This light also comes on if there is a failure in the ABS system. Should such a failure occur, the system reverts back to standard braking mode. It's the driver's responsibility to know if the car does or does not have ABS, because the correct response in an ABS car can be a dangerous response in a non-ABS car. Here, both drivers slam on the brakes and keep them on in a straight line stop from 50 miles an hour. The red car has ABS brakes. The white car has standard brakes. Both cars stop in about the same distance. But one stop like that will ruin a tire on a car without ABS. On a wet road, the same technique locks the tires on the white car easily, and it slides much further than the car with ABS. As you can see, the rolling tire stops the car faster than the sliding tire. Rolling tires steer the car, sliding tires don't. With maximum brake pedal pressure, we can see the wheels going back and forth, but the car slides in a straight line. Using the same maximum brake pedal pressure, the driver of the ABS-equipped car can still have confidence in the steering. Even on a wet road, the ABS-equipped car steers well under full braking. Let's compare. The drivers of both the red car with ABS and the white car without ABS will respond to a driving emergency, in this case entering a turn too fast, using the correct technique for an ABS car. When this driver hits the brakes hard, the wheels lock. The car slides straight through the cones even though the wheels are turned. With the driver of the ABS-equipped car hitting the brakes and turning the wheel in exactly the same way, the car holds the turn and stops safely. Here, a driver has misjudged his exit speed getting off the freeway. The brakes lock for an instant with a puff of smoke, and he can't steer. He releases the brakes so he can steer, but has too much speed. The car slides off the road where he makes a skillful recovery. At the same speed, the driver of the ABS car does exactly the same thing. He hits the brakes hard. Because he has ABS, the wheels don't lock up, so he can continue braking and steering aggressively and with confidence. Running wide on a curve and putting two wheels off the pavement is a challenge for any driver. We've all worried about a driver coming at us around a turn in the middle of the road. With ABS, the driver can slow down quickly and steer at the same time without losing control. This street driving example points out another advantage of ABS. The ABS system monitors each wheel independently. Should one or two wheels alone be near lockup, only those wheels' computer sensors will activate the anti-locking system. 
The two wheels in the dirt have far less traction, and under braking, they want to lock up. The ABS system prevents this from happening by activating the system only on those two wheels. ABS keeps the wheels from locking up under heavy braking. ABS doesn't add braking force, it only applies it in a different way. ABS brakes often produce a grinding, vibrating sound, and the brake pedal vibrates underfoot. This is normal. It tells you that the ABS system is working. With ABS, the driver can brake heavily with confidence and still steer aggressively without worrying about lockup. That's dangerous in a car without ABS. You have to know how the car you're driving is equipped to be safe. The anti-lock message on the dash means the car has ABS on all four wheels. Now here's a situation that can happen to any of us. You're driving along, you look down for a second, you look in the mirror, you adjust the radio or fish for toll money in the console. Suddenly, something catches your eye. You look up at the car you've been following, he's all over his brakes. You can't stop in time. It's going to be your fault if you hit him. What are some of your options? Well, what you can do predictably and consistently is take advantage of very nearly all the car has to offer in braking and turning capacity to avoid a crash. In the average crash, very little of that capacity is actually used. Well, let's assume there's room to make a quick lane change in this time. What do you do? In order to perform an emergency lane change effectively, you need to know exactly how you and your car respond to that situation. We have a drill that's extremely effective for making this kind of emergency reaction routine. In this exercise, the driver enters a lane of cones that represents a typical lane of traffic. At the end of the lane are two lights, one on either side. Five car lengths ahead of the lights is a cone barrier that represents any object that might be in your way. The two cones on the other side of the barrier are also the width of a typical lane of traffic. The object is to drive down the first lane at 50 miles per hour and go around the barrier on the side indicated by the light without using the brakes and return to the lane on the other side of the barrier. Keep in mind that at 55 miles an hour, the barrier is less than one second away from the turning point at the light. An emergency lane change at the absolute limit of the car without using the brakes usually consists of three turns. The first is to miss the offending object, the second to get pointed back toward the road, and the third to straighten out the skid started by the first two. And no matter how little time you have, how much you have to turn, or how threatening the object to be avoided is, a car can only turn just so fast. And there's no way you can change that. But the driver still has to get as much work done on the first turn as he possibly can. We come completely off the gas just before turning the wheel, so the forward weight transfer can give the front tires a little more grip. By rolling the wheel a third of a turn, quickly but smoothly, we get the most out of the front tires without upsetting the car's stability. The second turn has to be started the instant we know we're clear of the initial problem. In the third turn, we turn the wheels in the direction of the skid. By starting it as early as possible, we make the return to the straight ahead position smoother and more deliberate. There are a number of errors in technique that can severely limit your ability to get the most out of your vehicle. The first of them is turning your wheel too much. By turning the wheel too much, the driver will find that the back end of the car will start to slide out from underneath. The end result is that, in an emergency situation, your car will be carried too far in the wrong direction. Remember, you want to be quick but smooth with the car. If you turn the wheel too much, you won't be able to bring your car back under control and point it in the right direction. Another error many drivers make is to turn the wheel too late. Remember, for every one foot you're late turning the car, you'll go two feet in the wrong direction. You want to react to the situation quickly and smoothly. If you're late reacting, chances are you'll have to turn the wheel too much in the second part of the turn. Another common and dangerous error occurs when the driver feels the back end of the car sliding around in the second part of the turn and fails to quickly steer back in the direction he wants to go. 
This driver has frozen on the wheel and loses control. Some drivers want to apply power. It is true that applying power puts more weight on the rear wheels, but it is much more likely that in any real emergency scenario, more speed is the last thing anyone needs. Here is a typical scenario you might find yourself in where we can take the lane change exercise and put it to use on the street. You're on a side street driving 30 miles per hour. You approach an intersection with a two-way stop where you have the right-of-way. Here comes another driver approaching the intersection. He's supposed to stop. The driver with the right-of-way executed a perfect lane change where she recognized the situation, swerved to avoid, regained control of the car, and pointed her car back in the right direction. Let's review. Come off the gas to shift weight forward onto the steering tires before turning the wheel. Cut the first turn quickly and smoothly. Start the second turn without hesitation. The third turn corrects the skid. Too much steering will make the car fishtail. Hesitating on the first turn leaves too much work for the second turn. Don't stop the wheel at its point of furthest rotation. Bring it back to center. Most of the work has to be done with the first turn. Accelerating stabilizes the slide, but it also gives you less steering and less time. Once we've mastered this level of the emergency lane change, we can move on to the same maneuver, but also using brakes. Here we're going to combine braking to a full stop and turning. The driver finds that he can arrive at the signal lights a full five miles an hour faster than he could without the brakes and be sitting at a dead stop at exactly the spot that threatened a high speed spin earlier. Unless there is a compelling reason to avoid the brakes, such as traffic close behind or a slippery surface, hard use of the brakes enhances steering. Even in less than ideal circumstances, moderate use of the brakes substantially improves steering and control. Here's how the first step, the panic stop, works. First, the car with standard brakes arrives at the signal light at 50 miles per hour. Here we can see that with the use of standard brakes, a skilled driver is able to make the turn and come to a complete stop. The challenge is to use as much of the brakes as possible without locking up any of the four wheels. If he is successful, there is so much weight on the front two tires that he only needs half as much steering to make the turn as when he wasn't using the brakes at all. On a car without ABS, pumping the brakes will maintain steering control. Since all four wheels roll briefly at rhythmic intervals, steering is maintained. This car is pumping too slowly, allowing the nose to rise between pumps. This car, with more pumps, keeps the weight on the front tires. Now let's look at the ABS-equipped car through the same lane change exercise. In this case, the driver doesn't have to worry about controlling brake pedal pressure. He can slam on the brakes and focus on steering around the object in the way. Here is a typical scenario you might run into that will demonstrate the full use of ABS. The driver with the anti-lock brakes is in the red car. When this driver was faced with an evasive situation, she put on the brakes fully, the ABS system activated, and she was able to concentrate on steering around the car that had pulled out in front of her. 